We also visited Kaya Wu, which was a really interesting factory. Which is another, we'll call them like prototyping or small run manufacturing factory. Joe has been the manager who presented to us. He was really good. He was very approachable and there are a couple of other staff who came with us to the tour. Kaya Wu was really about focus on really high value products instead of just the quantity of them. And it was really great seeing, you know, HLH and Kai Wu right next door to like, you know, right kind of after each other because we can kind of compare and contrast. And it's really interesting to see just how different the factories are and what they specialize in. One of the processes we saw that was very suitable for low volume manufacture was silicon molding. And I think this place had, you know, they did the same kind of silicon molding and 3D printing and things like that. But what they were also doing was high quality medical grade units, but they were low, low quantity. And it was a good example of a situation where a silicon mold makes sense. They'd have a big, something that you might wheel around in an OR or in a, in a room, I don't know, a blood pressure monitor or something. Uh, in a hospital you see a, a big cart with a, a screen on it, there'll be you know, some specialised bit of instrumentation that gets wheeled in beside the bed and plugged into the patient. That's the sort of gear that they were making. Rather than tool up in hard steel to make this limited run of housings, they tooled up in silicon. And because it's very high value but low volume, it really made sense for them to use silicon moulds. Kaiwu was also making what looked like some quite large machines where that silicon moulding process makes perfect sense because the cost of the machines leads to them obviously not making thousands of them. A silicon mould is, is made and under vacuum urethane is, is drawn into it. The mould's then separated, part ejected, and you can do it up to up to about 20 times. They're able to very quickly put, put together a mould in a day. And we're actually able to see the moulds being opened. We were able to see the quality of parts that came out of the moulds. And we're actually able to see the mould finish itself. The end result is an extremely high quality finish, but they could do it using silicon moulds in very low volume. And they were making prototype parts for cars in Spain. Also, they were making robots that looked suspiciously identical <laughs> to the ones at HLH, maybe it's a trend. To make one robot, I think that is about 40 plus different parts they had to make. That's a very tedious process to do a mass manufacturing, so silicon molds perfect for that. And so it kind of also showed that this type of manufacturing was a legitimate form of manufacturing for things that you may only need a few of them. So that was a, a mold tool that was quite accessible in terms of cost. It would be rare to use it for production, although I believe you could do it uh, if you're only making a few things at a time. A silicon mold doesn't necessarily have to be a silicon mold. Silicon's just nice because it's easy to pour and make your master off a 3D printed part. If you don't want to do that, you can machine up a plastic mould or you can almost build it like paper mache. The, the mould can be almost body filled together and then as long as your mould surface is high quality, you can have a, a polystyrene mould. So that certainly you can shoot a very large part where a tool for a bumper bar for a car might cost $20 million because it's it's a 50 ton block of steel. I thought silicon moulding would only be for small parts but these these were up to a metre long these components. The parts generally need some hand finishing and they have a whole team of people who sit there and, and, and take off all the rough edges and fill in. What we were actually also able to see was that while this kind of mould was lower cost in terms of manufacturing of the tooling, there was a higher cost associated with the finished product in terms of the polishing that was required or breaking away from the excess material and those sort of things. So it was a labour intensive process. So we saw a room where there were many factory workers very carefully polishing the finish on the plastic and getting it to come up pretty much looking like a mirror. They were making little parts that would go into robots. But still far more cost effective for lower volume manufacturing than doing some sort of you know aluminium soft tool. The same tool for a bump Bar done as a vacuum casting tool might cost you two grand or five grand. So there's many orders of magnitude difference in cost to produce a very large part. So something that's a couple of metres wide, you have a mould that weighs 50 kilos instead of 50 tonnes. Kairu also had a metalworking factory, so they had a big uh, laser cutting machine and a bending machine. I also get to see the laser cutting machine in action. Their showcase was interesting because they had some very nice uh, CNC machine wood stuff. I would never have thought of using wood, but maybe not for our products, but in a different product, uh, being able to have something with a more natural feel might be the difference required. And seeing that you can do that with the CNC process and the, the quality of the finish of it was amazing. It was really good. They seem like lovely people, so they're, they're more than happy to do business with you. You've basically just got to start the conversation. They have big sales teams ready to go. It's just a matter of sending them an email, sending them some parts and getting on with it. You can get prototypes done 
really fast, really cheap, and you don't need to hire a full team. So there's almost no excuses to try and get prototypes out. And I think that almost gives a responsibility back to startups to say, if you've got an idea and you're working on it, you know, there really shouldn't be a huge amount of delay to, to getting that, you know, that prototype done. And the quality of the work is great. So if you're in the uh, maker business or you're in the prototype, don't exclude people like that just because they're in China. Rather than, if you, you, know, you, you may feel obliged to maybe make your own 3D parts or something like that because you don't know about these facilities. But if you explore them further, you can get really high quality CNC machine parts and things of that sort for not that much money. In which case you'll have something of the correct material the correct dimensions and a proper performing product as opposed to something that can be quite fragile. I think just knowing that these prototyping services exist and maybe I would go to them with a product now and go, you know, what sort of processes could we use to achieve the result required for the casing and not just go in saying, you know, I want to injection mould something in plastic. Barriers to entry to making plastics in China is so low. The prototyping houses are something you really can't do without. I mean, unless you've developed your own internal capability to do those things, which is very difficult. It's much, much easier just to go and send the design off to one of these houses and get it made. If you wanted to do ones and twos, the likes of Kai Wu and HLH are the perfect place to go. Kai Wu, uh, they were really approachable. The the people who were in charge, they were you know Chinese locals who had learned English. You know, like mo like a lot of the factories, they were very welcoming. But there was a little bit more of a language barrier there than there was at HLH. They're an extremely valuable resource when you when you know they exist. That was a quite an interesting turning point when I found out that hang on, there's a company over here that will just build stuff for you. That was like a light beam moment. Wow.